You're listening to another great podcast in the MyMac Podcasting Network. Tech Fan Podcast number 469. I'm Tim Robertson, joined by David Cohen all the way over in the UK, or am I all the way over here in the US? I don't know which one it is. Uh, I think it's a little bit both. A little bit of perspective. One, We're both far apart, let's just put it that way. Did we ever figure out how far apart we actually are? No. Um, but a quick Google will... Yeah, I do that. Battle Creek. So I'm in Battle uh, Creek, Michigan. You're in Manchester. And I, I'm going to guess without... I'm going to say it's like 3,500 miles. Uh, of course, this is but, Apple Maps, so it doesn't tell me. <laughs> yeah, you got to do it on Google Map. I think if you do... Uh, I'm going to Google it. Distance between... Yeah, you're right. Google got it right straight away. Yeah. All right. Tell me what your guess is before I, you were looking up. Okay. I said 3,500 miles. It's 36.99. Oh, I was pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say like 2,500 first, and I was like, no, it's more than that. Yeah. So I just won it by 1,000. I was pretty close. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad at all. So we've got a few things to talk about. Um, let, there are so many terms now. So many new things that an old tech head like me feels like I'm being left behind. Not because I can't understand it, but because I don't give a shit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that's, that's that's nothing to do with being an old tech head. It's just being old. Um, and and you just become more... Uh, you Well, I, I don't think you become more cynical. I think your life experience allows you to see things for what they are. Yes. Whereas when you're in your teens and 20s yeah, everything new is just new and you have no idea why why it might be cool yeah you don't have any context cool. yeah and then as you get older you realize um how cynical life itself is and how companies are and um how they're they're just trying to exploit you yep yeah there's a guy at work that's just turned 21 a few months ago yeah and he knows everything and i correct him all the time and he never wants to believe me but 99 out of 100 times he'll come back later and go hey by the way such and such you were right about that yeah shocker yeah. and th and then th this is the same sort of person and we all did this when we were younger yeah we would go out and uh they have like a new model car yep they have the uh you know the back well back in our time you know it would have been the the 1995 model yeah and uh, the 96 model comes out and it's got uh, wow i've got to upgrade because it's got 15 extra horsepower uh, and uh, improved grade leather on the seats. Yep. And he's just like, yeah, but you just bought that other one, and you're going to sell it. You're going to make a loss. Yeah? To, to get the... Oh, yeah, but it's totally worth it. And then they buy it, and they, you know, convince themselves it was totally worth it, even though they lost $4,500 yep. on it. Yep. Yeah? And that's the sort... And, and <laughs> when we get to our age, it's just like, yeah, you kind of go, yeah, well, I'll just keep it. Well, the guy at work <laughs> says... Uh, he. he it's not that he argues with me. He just doesn't believe me. Yeah. But he knows, and this is true, I'm just trying to help him sell more cars. Yeah. I, and I, I tell new people all the time, because I tend to do the training, yeah. <clears throat> I hope you sell a lot of cars. I hope yeah. you make salesmen of the month and of the year. And they're like, really? Why? And I tell them, you selling a car does not prevent me from selling a car. Yeah. <laughs> we're, yeah. there, I know management at every dealership wants to put the board up and who's in the lead and who's doing that and they try to make it a competition but yeah. I, it's not 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 really I, can I pay my bills? Yes, I'm happy am I well, putting yeah, some money not, away? Yeah. Yes, I'm happy not only that, the more successful <clears throat> the dealership is the less likely that anybody's going to get their job cut well, not only that, it, the more successful the dealership is, the more cars will earn, thus I'll be able to sell more cars. Yeah. So Yeah, it, it's it's not it's not I mean, I suppose at the moment there is probably a more limited supply of cars, but regularly. I always think those boards in the I sometimes you see them if you go into car dealerships have your car service, you see them up in the in one of the back offices. It always reminds me of the kill board in Wing Commander. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Where you know, you're not too far the, off. Yeah, the nature of the 
of the Wing Commander game, they put the kill board up in the bar, and as you play the game, you kind of rise up, because obviously you're a human, you kill far more ships than, than the game does in the game the the other character the non-playable characters in the game do so you very regularly rise up to the top but the thing is it doesn't mean anything because there is an infinite number of ships to kill in wing commander so it's it's a relatively meaning meaningless metric yeah you know and you're absolutely right the fact that you you know just in the same way as selling a car the fact that i killed a ship in wing commander doesn't stop anybody else playing it from killing one it's um I get more pleasure, honestly, of helping other people close deals than myself yeah. now. If yeah. that makes sense. So, so what did this guy saying in in respect to uh, you telling him that that you wanted him to make a sale? Well, it wasn't necessarily that. It's, I mean, it's a variety of things. And you know, he'll say, "Well, I'm going to tell the customer that," and I say, "No, don't don't tell him this. Try this thing instead." And he doesn't believe me, and he goes and does his thing, and the customer walks out. And then he comes, oh, you were right, I, that didn't work. And I tell him why mine would yeah. have worked. Well, if you would have said this, then this would have happened, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So then you can say, well, then this, and then you're done. They, they'll buy a car. It's usually trade value or something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, most customers nowadays know <laughs> there's not a lot of cars out there. So, you know, you can either be very patient and get exactly what you want. Or be more flexible and get one sooner. Which one do you want to be? Yeah. You don't you can't be both. Yeah. So and it's just, you know, he's a young guy. I like him. Mm-hmm. And I rub him a lot, but that's because I like him. Yeah. Like I call him Ron Weasley because he's got very red hair and he's almost his skin color is transparent. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so I call him Ron Weasley. He's got Scottish ancestry. He's got um a Chinese tattoo on the back of his neck towards his shoulder blades. Right. Where are you going with that? That's yeah, yeah, odd. it's it's that, isn't it? <laughs> so he's got this tattoo, and uh, I tell him all the time it says soy sauce. Right. And so then I found a funny. Uh, oh, yes, that's a, what's, <laughs> I go, what's why do you guys? Why do you have soy sauce on the back of your neck? Do you really yeah. like soy sauce? Doesn't say soy sauce. <laughs> do you speak Chinese? No. Do you read Chinese? No. Then how do you know it doesn't say soy sauce? <laughs> how do you know it doesn't say say uh, dumb dumb ginger American? <laughs> and so um, I found this funny picture online and I texted it to him, and it says, "What if Chinese had Chinese people had lame American or English words tattooed on their body in this real beautiful Chinese lady, and it says water on her arm." <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh huh. Soy sauce. So I tell. So <laughs> I enlisted the because I only tell him this when no one else is around that it says soy yeah. sauce. So I enlisted another salesman that doesn't talk to him very much, and yeah. I told him exactly what to do and say. Yeah. So he's in the uh, another office, and the other guy walks in and goes, "Why does it say? Why do you have ta- soy sauce tattooed on your n- neck?" And we made him super paranoid. It could be right. It could be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Until you get until you get somebody who can read Chinese characters. Yeah, you're just assuming that, you know, your Google search and the words were correct. It's not necessarily true. Well, not only that. I mean, we've all seen pictures on the internet of uh, of tattooists who speak English and are tattooing English, misspelling it. Oh, yeah. So I, I could imagine with, with a, a, a language like ch- written Chinese where each pictogram me- means a word that if you get a line in the wrong place, you could completely change the meaning of, of what the thing says. So just one line in the wrong place, and it could change it could change it from fire warrior to soy sauce. I saw a video <laughs> where fire somebody is supposed to spray paint stop at the stop sign, but it's on the street. Yeah. <laughs> S-O-T-P. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen stuff like that before. The best ones, the best ones here. So in Wales... It's the law in Wales that any uh, public sign that's put up by um, the, by the local district council or anything like that has to be printed in both English and Welsh, right? Even though um, not many people speak Welsh, it's kind of the, the Welsh law that everything has to be written in bilingually in both English and Welsh. English first and then the Welsh. And um, 
there was this uh, picture going on the internet a couple of years ago of this sign in a car park where it had all the instructions for how you were meant to park and everything like that in English. Yeah, and then a whole load of Welsh underneath. And once the sign went up, people who spoke Welsh wrote in and said, I'm afraid you don't understand what you've done because the Welsh they'd written on the sign said, I'm sorry, I'm currently on holiday. I will reply to your email on my return. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's it might work though. <laughs> wow. That is pretty good. Yeah. So, um again, things are happening in the tech world that I, I just don't care about. Um and a couple of the stories that we've got here kind of highlight that. The first is you texted me this. So, yeah. Ubisoft Ubisoft decided they're going to jump into the NFT things, even though, as you pointed out, they don't even understand really what it is. And I don't, I don't think most people do. Yeah. I, I know what's happening here because they're using a, um, their, their proposed NFT solution is using a third party blockchain. So what's happening is these third-party blockchain companies who are often venture capital funded are going to big, um, what they see as target markets and saying, you need to get into blockchain. And if you use our blockchain, then um, we can partner. We can make it all work for you. And you'll make loads of money and we'll make loads of money and it'll all be great. And uh, the execs go, oh, yeah, sounds great. And then they have to justify this. And they don't know what they're talking about because they really don't understand what they're getting into, except that somebody's told them it's going to make them a load of money. Mm-hmm. Um, so a- NFTs, for, for anybody who doesn't know or doesn't care and therefore hasn't paid a lot of attention, are non-fungible tokens. These are basically, they are, they're kind of like a digital watermark. And the idea originally of, a, of an NFT was that you could take something that was... Uh, you could mark it as trackable and potentially as you, as a unique item. Each NFT is unique. So each fungible token you attach to uh, a digital object. So let's say I unique. take a picture of an oak tree. Yeah. And it's a beautiful photo, yeah. but I want to sell that photo. Yeah. Well, and, how and, do you and, as, an, as the buyer know that you're getting the original photo? Well, uh, I'll probably turn it the other way around. More, more likely what would be, how do you as the seller want to make sure that somebody doesn't buy that photo from you and then make hundreds of copies and just send them everywhere and sell it as their own? Correct. So the idea with a non-fungible token attached to the image is that you can prove that you were the original creator of the image. And you can also notionally, through the blockchain, track where that particular image has gone. So if you so you can say, well, I sold it to this guy and he now has the rights to it and you can control what rights you do. So that's that was the idea of uh, of using blockchain technology. And the thing with blockchain, like cryptocurrency, and everything is that every time a transaction occurs, it's permanently stored in the blockchain and it's 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 permanently marked. And it, because it uses crypto uh, technology. The idea is that the blockchain can't be changed, so you can't go back and say, oh, I never sold it, and that sort of thing. The problem is, is that like all technologies, uh, they have their upsides and their downsides. The downside of of blockchain technology is that because you've got a distributed uh, chain of transactions that spread over everybody who's running the blockchain software... Yeah, that means every time you make a transaction, the energy cost of that transaction is enormous because there's hundreds of thousands of computers running the blockchain. And so and they all update their record of the transaction as it happens. So it's really, really bad for the climate and the environment because you've got a whole load of computers doing kind of make work just to try and keep track of, of, of what's happening in the blockchain. Um, the other problem with it is that the the token itself is is just a digital it is just a digital watermark it's nothing more than that and what these companies who are flogging blockchain technology are trying to do are they're trying to convince get companies like gaming companies that they can make a lot of money by using blockchain technology on their digital transactions so with ubisoft they're talking about putting it into a game 
So the idea is is the kind of tchotchkes you buy as downloadable content in the game, the kind of the skins and things like that. They're talking about using a um, using a, a non fungible token attached to each one. And they, the reason they're doing that is because the guys selling the blockchain technology are saying, oh, NFTs are hot right now, and if you do that, people will buy more of them. Yeah? but And they, they're completely downplaying With the idea the, that you can resell it. But, yeah, but that's the problem. You can't. Right. Because when you look behind this, you can't. Because you can only... The blockchain technology token, the NFT, only works when the blockchain it's attached to still exists. Right, and there are hundreds of these things. So, if this VC company goes to Ubisoft and say, "Right, use our blockchain technology," Ubisoft themselves then has to build an interface between their um, blockchain and and the NFTs they create and their digital content. They have to tie that stuff together. That means that they have to run servers to do all of that. Well, we all know what gaming companies do is once the game is out of fashion, they shut everything down. At which at which point your NFT even if it was notionally worth something, you had a rare item, becomes worthless anyway because you can't validate the NFT anymore. Right. Yeah? And the second thing is that it's kind of like putting uh, a collectible number on a Star Wars model figure. Yeah? You know, we the, the Star Trek ones in particular used to do this, where they would put a unique collector's ID on the back of the box to try and make out it was more exclusive to fool people into saying oh it's collectible and all of that yeah but you are talking about objects that don't really exist are generated by a computer yeah and can be churned out in in as much demand as as the uh can, as whatever the demand is ubisoft can churn them out uh, as much as they want so they have no intrinsic value at all they're not rare uh, oh, and by the way, also, yes, I mean, in, in few years' time, they might become completely worthless. Because let's face it, if you buy a, a skin for a game and the game doesn't run anymore, then what is the skin worth? Yeah. It's worth absolutely nothing. nothing. Yeah. Yeah? So this is why we see these things about um, NFTs in games, and there's been a lot of gamer backlash against these, because uh, uh, I think it was Stalker 2, Chernob uh, something of Chernobyl, were talking about doing this as well, and they got such an... The game is in development. They got such a negative response from their potential players that they backed away from it. And a lot of people are, are responding in much the same way because nowadays many gamers are not uh, young kids or people in their early uh, 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 late teens or early 20s. They're guys like us who are a little bit older, have seen a few things, and we recognise that these things are intrinsically worthless. And we're going, well, blockchain doesn't really bring anything but i'm sure that here. ubisoft though has listened to the criticism and has embraced that criticism and made change no. wait they, they didn't do that <laughs> so so a couple of things the story here basically said that you that ubisoft's yeah a lot of ubisoft execs have been out trying to salvage this pr disaster um one of them said that that oh well the problem is is that is that gamers just don't they they, they don't understand it they're too stupid to understand it, really. They don't understand the value we're bringing to them with this technology, which is <laughs> rude, apart from anything else. It's like, you know, um, and it, sh it sh well, it does. It shouldn't be a surprise because I think, uh, again, those of us who have been around a while know that an awful lot of people who run gaming companies are horrible people. Yeah. And they treat, they treat their customers... Yeah, by the fact that they turn out games that are unfinished or are full of bugs or um, have uh, dubious practices in them, whatever. They treat their customers like garbage. So why would they respect the views of their customers turning around and saying, we don't want the thing that you're plugging at us that you think is going to make them a lot of money? Right? That's point one. And then the, and then um, in a further PR move, which I didn't put in the show notes, but I, re I actually read this morning... There was a couple of execs who were who were being interviewed about this, and at one point they said, "Oh, we love our gamers. Our gamers, you know, our customers, our gamers, you know, gamers have to drive everything we do. You know, our gamers are are our, uh, you know, that we we respect. And gamers are always right." And then within a few minutes later, they were back on the, um, you know, the customer doesn't understand this. But the problem is they were specifically asked what advantages NFTs would bring them over over a different any other form of drm that's involved in in the, the the stuff in their games and they they couldn't come up with a cogent answer because they don't know because all they know is they've been told that this will make them money 
and so they they've kind of jumped into it with both feet and they've no idea what the te- what advantages the technology has because the reality is when it comes to selling tchotchkes in games there are no advantages no advantages at all all it go- all it does do is while the thing while the block the blockchain for those nfts is up and running is it gives the gaming company more control that's all it does mm-hmm. it doesn't do any benefits for the customer at all uh, and it, oh by the way it's also bad for the planet um, speaking of gaming companies, I don't know if we talked about this or not. Maybe we did on the Geeks Pub, but Microsoft is buying Activision Blizzard. This yeah. came out, what, two weeks ago. Um, I keep coming back to the story because I'm not sure this is great for the gaming community or the tech industry as a whole, but... A part of me thinks, okay, it it makes sense. Microsoft's entire strategy isn't to sell video games in the conventional way. They are clearly moving towards a subscription model that's going to encompass everything. And the best way for that to succeed is to actually own the game. So they don't have to come up with, you know, agreements with 5,000 different game publishers. They own the biggest games out there from... And let's be honest, Activision and Blizzard are two of the very biggest companies out there when it comes to gaming, the most popular. And now Microsoft will be able to say, when the next World of Warcraft comes out, it's going to be a Microsoft exclusive. And oh, by the way, it's free. Well, it's not really free because uh, it's a subscription, but... I I take issue with this. I I think there's been a lot of concern about the whole exclusivity thing. But the reality, if you look at Microsoft Game Pass is they don't care where you pay the play the game. Yeah, it's it's available for the Xbox and the the uh, the service is very much orientated towards Xbox and PC. But they have a very robust cloud gaming solution. So you can play you can play that game on your iPhone, your iPad. No, no, no but it's still free yeah. because you're a subscriber. Yeah, yeah, but the point is that what I'm what I'm trying to say is that there's, there's been a lot of people getting hung up saying, "Oh, you know, the, these Activision games might only ever be available on the Xbox." Well, you can play them on uh, a different console if that console allows you to stream games from Microsoft's uh, Game Pass servers. And yes, you've got to have the subscription. And you're absolutely right. Microsoft makes no money on the Xbox consoles, and I don't think they made you hu- make a huge amount of m- money out of the. Um, third-party games that are published on the xbox no right but the big money they want to make is the same sort of money they make with um azure which is their cloud their cloud server platform and microsoft 365 which is their uh, enterprise business platform is they want you to be a regular subscriber and then they get a steady revenue coming in from you right it is repeatable income and that they can predict that long term that's and important the, for businesses. Yeah, and this is the model that's been very successful in video streaming. So let's Netflix say there's Disney Plus. 50 million Xbox owners. And let's say right now, 20% of them are a subscription. They're on the subscription plan. This well, will ensure I, it's probably more. But No, I, I think I think the last number I heard from a Microsoft podcast and this was about between twenty five and thirty million Xbox Active uh, Game Life. Pass subscribers. Okay. At the moment, yeah. So it's a big number, but it's gonna get a lot bigger when you they're starting to release more and more almost on a you know, bi monthly basis. And when I say bi I mean every two months, not every twice a month. Um new AAA titles. And then sprinkle yeah. in some of the smaller games, and all of a sudden, yeah. look, I, I've said on this show and on Geeks Pub, Microsoft Game Pass is, and with the uh, new Xbox Series S, is the best choice for gamers right now, bar, oh, yeah. bar none. It's just so superior to anything that micro, or, uh, Sony or Nintendo is doing. Yeah, you you spend depending on which which tier you buy, yeah. you spend between seven and eleven dollars a month. Yeah, right. Which is competitive. To well, that's buying a that's couple, two AAA games in a AAA year. Two AAA titles a year. Yeah, but you get access to everything that they have on there, um, and and yeah, games come in and out. And obviously, part of Microsoft's strategy because they bought Bethesda last year, uh, and Bethesda obviously have a lot of big games, 
But my, part of Microsoft's strategy here is they want the best titles inside Game Pass. Yep. Um, and that's what I'm saying. I don't think... I mean, at the moment, with the um, with the relative relative numbers of consoles out in the world uh-huh. would not make sense because Activision runs Call of Duty. It doesn't make sense now, no, yeah. but it will in no. the future. But Exactly. This is a long play. Yes. Yeah, and at some point, they will turn around and say, you know what, it makes sense for the next Call of Duty game not to be available on PS5, yeah. but you'll be, able to, you'll be able to play it through Game Pass. And, uh, and if you don't, if you have a PS5 and you can't play it because um, uh, Sony won't let you access Game Pass then, you know, you can use your web browser, you can use your Chromebook, you can use your PC, you can use your phone, whatever you want, to still play the game. Yep. Uh, and and <clears throat> that that means that they still get revenue, even if you've not bought into the Xbox ecosystem. So we- they're going, they being Sony, is going to follow suit. They're going to go to a subscription model. They kind of have two different things right now that kind of equal that, but not really. They're going to consolidate and uh, go the same route. No question in my mind. Yeah. Because this is, is the future of gaming. Yeah. The problem is is they probably won't be able to cut deals with any publisher who's owned by Microsoft because Microsoft wants it on the Game Pass yeah. platform. Yeah. yeah. They, they, so, they better do it really quickly. So I think there's going to be a buying frenzy in the next two years of the big publishers, Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, buying more third-party companies. Include and I think this is this isn't the kickoff of it because this has been going on for a little while now. Sony's been well, doing yeah. the same thing, but I mean, so, it's going to go own, yeah. much bigger. Sony owns a lot of studios yep. already, so uh, that stuff is okay. And I will say, Microsoft has been a better steward so far than Sony when it comes to yeah. th- Minecraft. Is a perfect example. Microsoft has owned Minecraft for a number of years now. Yeah, and it's still uh, and- playable on the iPhone on. Um, the PS5, I mean, they're yeah. smart about it. So here's the difference, I think, between Sony and Microsoft. Sony is is always looking to juice their relationships to sell more hardware. Yeah. Yeah? Microsoft, as Microsoft said, Microsoft's strategy for a long time now is, is if you run our software, we don't care where you run it. That's, I mean, that was one of the first things that Satya Nadella changed when he when he became CEO. Yeah, he got away from uh, Windows first type of thing. Yeah, exactly. He basically said, said, I don't care if you're running, if you're paying Microsoft money, I don't care where you run it. And immediately Office became available for the iPad. Um, yeah, it's and smart Office move. It's now available anywhere. It's smart. You can, yeah, you can play it on the, you can yep. use it on the web. That's the biggest that. difference think, between Bill yeah. Gates and him is that he immediately saw the folly of sticking with a monoculture, i.e., you got to live in Microsoft's world to really take advantage of all these things. Well, uh, the advantage Nadella had is he previously previously had worked in Azure, so he yeah. and he'd run that he'd run Azure, so he knows what the power of the cloud is. Yep. And the reality is, he sees the long term future is that um, we will have less and less uh, l- local processing and local computing. Because everything will we it, it can be delivered more easily from the cloud. Yeah. Um. You know, and we're and we're, we're transitioning into that now, um. And uh, every year it gets better and better. Well, I subscribe to, and I did it right here on the show one day, a couple months ago, uh, to my to Adobe just so I can get Photoshop. Yeah. And I don't regret it because I like Photoshop. It, i.e., it is the best, of course, but. I like my my muscle memory on doing photo manipulation is all Photoshop. I, I used it way too many years. Now, yeah. are there capable third party things? Yes, but I was tired of jumping through hoops and trying to reteach myself how to do something. Yeah, when I can do the same thing in Photoshop easier, quicker, and I just know how to do it. But here's the difference between what Microsoft 365 does, where you can do all of that stuff on the web. And I own a Chromebook, and you know what? I have done this, where I've sat downstairs at my kitchen table, and I've spent all day working in the Microsoft ecosystem through the web. Yep. And you know what? I can do an awful lot of what I need to do for work just by using the web browser. Mm-hmm. So here's the difference, though. And, and uh, uh, Adobe is, is interesting because... They were very early with subscription Way software early. Modeling. Yeah, they jumped but, under that bandwagon, I think, as a major publisher way yeah. before anybody else. But the problem with uh, Adobe is that um, you subscribe and then you have to download their um, 
Creative Cloud app and then that manages your local installs and makes sure you don't put Photoshop in too many places and all this sort of thing. And frankly, it's a pain in the neck. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big bloated application. There are other applications are big and bloated as well. It's It's got that problem where it's constantly updating stuff in the background. Those software applications would work more easily and I think they would get more... Um, subscriptions if they had a cloud model where you could actually run Photoshop remotely. You know, send your pic. Yeah, I mean, they have a, uh, a a cloud storage system already. So you could put all your files up in the cloud too, and then you could process. You, there's no reason you have to do it locally. Well, and Microsoft's already said they're coming out with a web-based Photoshop app. Exactly. Well, yeah, but, but you know, I think Adobe is very late to the game in that, isn't it? They, they, they've been doing the subscription thing for a for so many years yeah but they'll get uh, there and, well yeah yeah i i think that their long-term plans is very similar to what microsoft's doing honestly and yeah I, I, it's just the way it's going to be i think that apple arcade is the early attempt from apple to do the same thing personally i, mean, I think what? every game on ios should just be if you're subscribing, you could just download anything. I think yeah. that well, would be a huge going that benefit. Way. They are. They've uh, the, the last couple of years they've been taking lots of older games and redoing them so that they're uh, they work in arcade. Yep. And um, you know what? I again just looking at the uh, it's only anecdotal data. It's not real data. But I look at how my family use Apple Arcade and they almost exclusively use because before um, before we I shared my Apple Arcade subscription with them. Most of the stuff that particularly my wife and daughter played were these like puzzle type games, you know, kind of variations on Candy Crush and yeah, things where you shoot right. bubbles around and word puzzles and stuff like that. And they would they would get these free freemium games and they would never pay the the freemium company any money, so they would put up with the adverts, yeah, um, and all of that and uh, and the timers and and all of that. Now now a lot of those styles of games are available in App Arcade and they love it because they can just download them, play them, not have, not be bothered with ads and timers and stuff like that. And then when they're finished with it, they move on to another one. Yep. And it kind of demonstrates how the um the Microsoft Game Pass model because the Apple Arcade model is is exactly the same. It's it's how how it works. For a lot of people don't want to be dealing with buying stuff. Do I choose to buy it? Is it any good? Um, all of that stuff. They just basically want to pay a fee every month and then just play what they want to play in, out the platform. So how does that work if you're a game developer? Where's the benefit? If you're an independent developer and you want to be in Microsoft Game Pass or you want to be in Apple Arcade um, or PS Plus or whatever it is, is it a set fee or do you get a set fee for everybody who downloads it? I mean... I don't know. I don't know what those business models look. I've never seen I know, one. I know that what what most of the indies appear to do, from what I've seen, is that they will launch their indie games on all of the stores they can. So they'll launch them on Steam. That some of them will launch on Good Old Games and stuff like that. They'll also then put them through the Nintendo Store as as kind of cheap uh, cheap downloads for the Switch and that sort of stuff. And then what ha what seems to happen is when they build up enough bars and mass. Um, then they appear on um, other platforms, including Game Pass. There's a game I play called Zeno Crisis, I think, which is it's like a twin stick shooter. It's very much a eight to five type thing, yeah. And it's a great game. Uh, and I was aware that it was available on the Switch, and I'd seen it on Steam and all of that as well. And then uh, after it had been out for about eight, ten months, something like that, it suddenly appeared on Game Pass, and then now I'm playing it on Game Pass, which I enjoy is the, e the easiest way for me to play that game. Um, so I think that, I think that's the way it does. How they get compensated for that in terms of um, in terms of that, I don't know. And it's a, it, it presumably is a very different model from. You know, what I'm thinking that is. it's a, it's super secret because I've never seen numbers from any gaming company that's accurately describes how that works for them and why yeah. it's a benefit. So I'm thinking they must sign some pretty hefty non-disclosure agreements with these companies. Yeah, I, I should say. Now, if someone's seen this, if they've if they've seen the business plan and how the how it works for an independent game company. 
How, I guess I guess it's I, I would really like depend to know. on how big your game is. I would imagine if your game is fairly small, then what would happen is that is that um, I would the streaming think, service would give you a flat fee per year or something like that. I would think that your you game's would get got more. If if I made a small independent game, and I charge five bucks for it, and I throw it up on Steam, and it's on Nintendo's, and it's on you know iOS and Microsoft. Um, it's on all the platforms, but it's a small five dollar game. How do I get that game to be successful? You know, what's the marketing strategy? Whereas if I make it and I get a, I don't know if it's a fixed dollar, or it's per download, whatever it is. By being in the subscription service, I don't have to worry about marketing it as much, do I? Because it's free. People could just download it. It doesn't cost yeah. them anything. Yeah, but I don't. I wouldn't imagine that that the uh, the game services like Xbox Game Pass. If you had a small game, they would pay you per download because if the game if it if it became the next Wordle and it blew up overnight, they would be paying a lot of money, and they probably don't want to pay a lot of money. Um, so I would imagine they probably cut you a check for a a, a, a fee for for whatever they the period because these games come and go on these game pass platforms so if they you know say right it's going to be on there for 18 months and they pay you a monthly fee for it being on there uh, and then they take it away again or renew it depending on how popular the game's been right so but i wouldn't it, imagine i wouldn't imagine they they pay per use no they could, um, i don't think so either but maybe we could be wrong because if a game blows up big why would you want to be on that platform again when you made you know one tenth of the money that you could have that you could argue well because it blew up because it was free yeah but yeah sometimes these games blow up the the the, i mean look wordle's a very good example that was a free it's a free game that the guy just did kind of on a lark and for some reason it captured the zeitgeist and became really really popular and even now he's not looking to monetize it um he just did it he did just did it for fun yeah um so you can't sometimes you can't control what becomes popular i mean if you look at the games that become huge well but that's not the question though the question is if a game if you release a game on let's just use game pass as an example and it blew up right yeah and you sign this agreement that it's free for 18 months and let's just say they're going to give you seventy five thousand dollars. now if your game didn't do shit 75 grand is pretty freaking sweet yeah if it blows up and 50 million people are playing it well if you were charging five bucks and you even got a quarter of that you made a ton more money yeah but you know i guess that's the the that's the gamble you take unfortunately um you know some people would say i imagine would say well the game might never have blown up had it not appeared yeah i made i made that argument i get that but Uh, and also i remember i one thing i do remember you remember that game flappy bird that sure. exploded that was done by that vietnamese guy yep now i remember it got to the point that he just kind of became a recluse because he was so sick of people talk to him about it and also as well he had a whole lot of hassle he got people saying oh, i bought the game i don't like it um oh i was misled by this oh i bought a clone it's you need to give me a refund and you know the problem is he was he had a game that became hugely popular and he was just one guy and he could not deal with managing that yeah did now, he sell that if, did he end up selling flappy uh, bird I don't, I, I don't know what he did with it um i'm i've no idea but the thing is i do remember that it became kind of you know when you hear about these guys who win the lottery and then say 20, 10 years later i wish i'd never won it um this is this is the same thing he he became he became unable to deal with the huge overnight success he accidentally generated. Now, if you're behind Game Pass or something else like that, Apple Arcade, whatever, you don't have to deal with that because the the people who run the platform do that for you. So that's the advantage you've got as well, is that, you know, yes, you might not be making as much bank, but um, you also don't have to deal with that direct interaction with the customer uh and the uh you know the challenges people have and that sort of thing because you're you know you're you've out effectively outsourced that to a third party oh, stupid cat jumped up on my lap and decided to use his claws to make sure he got all the way up well that's that's what cats do yeah he's a little guy so flappy bird as an example uh yeah 
In 2013, it became a, or I should say early 2014, became a sleeper hit. And at one point, he was earning $50,000 a day. Can you hear the purring for the cat? Yeah, I can. Yeah. He, she's very happy. No, don't eat my Microsoft, key, or my uh, microphone cable there, buddy. Um, but he took it down in February of 2014 because he said he felt guilt over what he considered to be its addictive nature and overuse. Uh, I think I suspect it was it was more about in August of 2014. The hassle he had. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Uh, a revised version called Hap- uh, Flappy Bird, called Flappy Bird Family, was released exclusively for Amazon Fire TV. Um, and they they did a coin op thing. They licensed it, but I, I don't I don't know if the original Flappy Bird is even out there anymore. Uh, I've got a feeling it might be on um, arcade now. I think you might be right. Um, yeah. But, I mean, if he was making $50,000 a, ga- a day at the height, wow. I mean... Well, yeah, I mean... The, 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 I had the Flappy other, Bird. I remembered it. I remember it yeah. very well. Everybody had the, it. Here's the other side of this. There, there are some people who, once you make a certain amount of money, they lose interest in making more money. Yeah? If you're making $50,000 a day, right, and you've got that money coming in for three months, right, for a lot of people, that's enough money that... More money than they ever need for the rest. You know, it's time to take a long vacation. Not, not in America. Well, yeah, but the problem then is you, you then get judged on what you do afterwards. The pressure to succeed after you've done something like that is yeah. very difficult. Yeah, I wouldn't. No. I wouldn't want that. You know, kind of success and making that. Oh wait, never mind. Yeah, I would. <laughs> um, we're still waiting for this show to blow up like that. So uh, well, we're gonna <laughs> NFT this bitch. Um, I love Roku. You know, I've got three Roku TVs in my house. One is Roku because I plug a little box into it. The other two are actual. Ow! 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 Son of a bitch! Um, oh, right. Where really, are they? Yeah, they are. That's, that's an interesting take on Roku. Stop using right your claws. I don't have any pants on. Uh, I'm in my underwear. Sweet. We really didn't want that image. Yeah. I'm, listeners, I'm so sorry. His little claws, or her little claws. Ow, ow. Oh, she got me good that time. Mm. Oh, that one might draw blood. Um, well, well, I think I think we've all learned that pants and podcasting are two things that should go together. Well, I've got my pants right next to me on the thing. I just haven't put them on. <laughs> that's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> That's like saying, yeah, the ship might be sinking and, and my life jacket is just over there, but I don't need to actually wear it. I got it close to me. She's a, a very, I, I believe I've talked about this cat, that this is the cat that is multi-generational um, feral. feral cat that mm. we brought in the house. And I will say this, it learns very fast. It's so grateful. It just... It loves people. It loves everything in the house. So grateful it sank its claws into your leg. Well, it's because it's trying to climb up because I was petting it. And then she fell off the chair and then went to get back up. She's also exploring. See, if I hold her up here, you hear the purring. Yep. Yeah. She. Oh, right up on the microphone. She's smelling the microphone. Oh, there you go. Mm. You're, you're natural. Yeah. Performing on cue. Um, uh, she's not wearing any pants either. She is not. So, okay. I like the product. You know, I like the interface. What I don't like is Ars Technica had an article a couple weeks ago that I'm not sure. It, this had to have been a mistake. It had to have. There's no way that Roku thought that, well, we're going to start doing this because it'll make us more money. Putting banner ads over live TV. There's no way in the world they thought that anybody in Roku thought this was a good idea. This had to have been a te- technical glitch because I haven't heard anything since that this so, is the, the technical glitch could be turning them on. However, presumably somebody had to write the technology to allow their devices to display banner ads over TV. I mean, that doesn't yeah, but that doesn't thought, necessarily mean they were actually going that, to do it. Well, somebody at some point said, let's write the code so we can do that. So presumably somebody at Roku thought that it was an option. And that even that concerns me. Yeah. Yeah, because 
you know, turning it on by accident is one thing, but the the point is is if you decide that you're never going to run banner ads over live TV, then you don't write the code to do that, and then you can't accidentally turn it on. And presumably, at some point, somebody has thought, let's let's have this capability because we might need it in the future. And at that point, that just makes me feel extremely gross. I want to know how they knew it was live TV as opposed to I'm playing a video game. Because, okay, so the interface on Roku, you just select a different input, right? And then that input, if it's, you know, just Roku, you can launch different apps within that input. Otherwise, you go to, say, HDMI 1, which happens to be my cable box. HDMI 2 might be uh, an Xbox or a PlayStation or what have you, right? How do they know which ones to run the ads on? Well, um, apparently, this is the, these weren't appearing on uh, independent Roku devices. These were appearing on Roku TVs. Right, but you, it's the same thing. There's no difference. No, it's not. Well, it's not. The TV, the th- difference is this, the TV, yeah, it, it, it's running every image through its processor even if you're not running the roku software so just like you can press the menu button and it can overlay the tv controls over live tv i would imagine that it was capable of um well it, obviously it was it was capable of overlaying these banner ads on but how does it know TV that it was live way. tv as opposed to what other input well, because it because it knows where it's getting its signal from so when you when you select a, a, a signal um, you know, because you, cause your inputs are... Um, but it doesn't live- know if I'm watching something on my DVR or... It doesn't know that. It, or does it? Well, I don't I don't know exactly. I've not I've got one of these seasons. I don't know exactly when the, the things came up. Maybe it was people who were watching Roku TV, which was streaming from the internet. Could be. Yeah? I think this but, but- is um, a good way to put yourself out of business. Because if this became a thing... TVs are cheap. If if people that had a Roku TV all of a sudden started getting banner ads when they're playing a game or watching a sporting event or something, I guarantee you those TVs would be replaced on a fairly short basis. Within a year, their company would be out of business. Yeah. Because nobody's going to buy the product. It, it, the backlash on this would be massive. So I think this was absolutely a mistake someone made there. I don't think it was intentionally turned on. Because if it was, it would have been turned on for everybody. Um, yeah, this was apparently it was cert- just certain models of Roku of TVs with Roku internals on them uh, from Sharp. Apparently, the TCL ones didn't do this. Um, yeah, I, but, I didn't have the problem. You know, as I say, it, as I well, as I say, yeah, and it was only the t- the TVs. It wasn't if you were running an external Roku box, right? Right. But the problem is for me is the fact that somebody when they're designing those TVs said, "Well, we need the capability to be able to put banner ads." over the picture and um th- this is all unfortunately we we see this time and again in tech is that you buy something with a certain set of capabilities uh, and then later on they either turn something on that that uh, makes it less pleasant to use or or even worse they turn something off which breaks the thing because yep. it's relying on back-end services um you know, it's it's hostile. It's user hostile. Obviously, all these companies are constantly looking at ways of monetizing us, um, and um, some of them do it more overtly than others. I th- I think in some respects, what kind of annoys me about this is not the fact that these things happen. Is it's the fact that um, they happen without us being told. Wow. Um, and and the, the you know the companies are not upfront about what they might want to do or not want to do to us in the future, you know. Because and and that means you can't make informed buying choices. You know, we've recommended those Roku t- Roku TVs exactly. before. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then it then it turns out that, that even accidentally they've done something like this, which is uh, is obviously now fortunately, you know, public pressure, social media user comment is is more easily heard than ever before you know going back to the ubisoft nft things is they're getting pushed back people got pushed back on this and roku very quickly sorted it out even if it was just a bug i never heard Um, anything from roku addressing this maybe they did i didn't well well uh, apparently they weren't 
they they said to ours that it was a bug that they'd fixed. I don't think they contacted anybody directly. Yeah. And as I said, they wouldn't have contacted you because you don't have one of those TVs. Yeah. So you, it wasn't something that affected the the external hardware they use. Let's um, uh, switch gears here towards the end of our show and talk about the big news that came out this week. Uh, and it kind of permeated both the tech world uh, as well as, I would say, social media and mainstream media, which is Neil Young, who's always doing shit like this, by the way, um, came out and said he wanted his m- music removed from Spotify over the misinformation on the Joe Rogan podcast. He basically kind of gave them an ultimatum, but not really, um, because yeah. they just removed his music. So Joe Rogan is famous for, um, he will say just giving different opinions and stuff on there and that he tries not to make up his mind, but that's horseshit when it comes to the vaccines and stuff. Cause he has promoted completely unproven, in fact, proven to be harmful remedies yeah. for COVID. Um, and he's had a successive of anti-vax guests on his yes, shows. Over and over yeah. and over. So he, he's, he can't, he, on this issue, he can't claim to be a dispassionate witness he is he definitely has an angle and his angle is clearly well i think joe rogan was very open to a lot of different things um i think his um his personality lends itself to conspiracies way more than most people and that's fine and i used to find him entertaining because he had some good points he's a smart man on a lot of topics and he was very curious he'd have people on that he didn't agree with as well and argue with them but I think when the whole uh, him him getting COVID uh, and then start, starting to spread misinformation, the mainstream media kind of went after him a little bit. And some of it was kind of bullshit. Uh, Fox or uh, CNN posted something that really wasn't true. And it kind of pushed him over to the far right wing now. Right. And he found an audience there. Um, I, Joe Rogan's just one of these guys that eventually will disappear, just like Adam Carolla did, just like um, what's his name, uh, Howard Stern did. He'll yeah. eventually go away. But the whole point here was Neil Young didn't want to be associated with him on the same platform. Yeah. So is, who do, who is Spotify going to side with? Joe Rogan. They just gave him hundred million dollars to be exclusive on their platform. And let's be honest, this was great news for Spotify. All of a sudden. They're in the news yeah, on their biggest property. Look, they, they, as we've said many times before, Spotify has a right to allow anybody they want on their platform. Um, and they have a right to take an editorial judgment about what Joe Rogan says on his show. Yep. Or, or they have a right to decide not to take an editorial judgment on what he says on his show, which is probably more the case here. I'm sure when he signed that deal, part of the deal was... Uh, probably covered in some in some fairly dense legal language exactly what the editorial relationship between Spotify and Joe Rogan. Well, they have none. Joe Rogan actually publicly said this when the whole thing went down that well, he, Spotify yeah. has zero input on that's, any content. And that's you know what that's if we were offered offered a Spotify deal, that's the sort of deal we would want as well. You don't want yeah, for a hundred million, they can tell me what they want me yeah. to say and not say. Well, that. okay, that's fine. Um, but but obviously, you know. The, as we said before, if if that's the deal he has, that's the deal he has. Yep. However, Neil Young has a, also has a perfect right Absolutely. to say what he said, yep. uh, and to if he can convince his record company, who supported him in this case, to basically support taking his music off Spotify, um, then he's got a right to do that. And and Warner Brothers, his his label, uh, his well, ultimately his corporate owners, said, yeah, we agree with that. That's fine. Uh, Joni Mitchell has said the same thing. Yep. She says she doesn't want to be on Spotify anymore, and that's absolutely fine as well. So, who's the biggest is- artist in the world right now? Probably that one girl. Um, she's re-recording her music so she can own Taylor Swift. Tra- so, if Tw- Taylor Swift came out and did exactly the same thing, say, "I want my music off Spotify," if they're going to have Joe Rogan, do you think that would have had a bigger impact on Spotify? I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I th- Taylor, Taylor Swift wasn't on Spotify for a while. Um, well, forget about that. I'm just saying, if she came out and said that, and by the way, saying, I love yeah. what Apple did. They put this big banner up, the home of Neil Young now yeah. for Apple Music. Yeah, 
but but no but she's had these sorts of arguments Cheeky on, bastards. on different to- on different topics with spotify before yeah she felt that the, um, the the streaming royalties available weren't fair All right uh, and so she for a long time her music wasn't on spotify right so there is look there is not i don't i don't think there's any one artist or any even a group of artists necessarily who can affect this change and i i don't think i necessarily would want them to because it shouldn't be the artists who drive change it should be the customers who drive change if people don't want to listen to joe rogan then they should not listen to joe rogan if an artist they respect comes out with this and they decide to change their listening habits that's completely fine with me that is what what's been lost in the world in the last 15 years or so is the ability to for people to have different opinions without anybody having to go away yeah that is what's been lost you know i think i think the difficulty that spotify has is that ultimately you know if they if their if their um listener numbers change uh, and then their shareholders go well you know we don't like this publicity that that happened yeah no, i would just i disagree with you to a certain extent i think that Yes, the audience should definitely have the, the say in what's going to be popular or not, what people are watching and listening. I agree with that to a certain extent. But I will say in this case, um, when you've got someone that's spreading misinformation the way Joe Rogan is, that is literally causing people to die. This isn't, you know, well, maybe who. No, people listen to Joe Rogan, they take his advice. And they die of COVID. They die. There was a, a story this week, maybe it was last week, where a police officer who didn't want to get the shot and did not want to wear masks uh, was on his radio and did this whole, I'm signing off for the last time because you're not yeah. going to force me. He just died of COVID. Yep. Because he's a idiot. And yeah. that's the kind of people that if they weren't listening to Joe Rogan, maybe they would have got better information. If they weren't listening to Fox, maybe they would have got better information. So for Spotify to go, well, you know, it's freedom of choice and we believe it's causing deaths. Now, well, so if you I, don't like his yeah. content, Spotify, go ahead and cancel him from your platform. I just did that within the last year of somebody that was spreading hate, that was yeah. saying things that were just beyond the pale. And he was on our network. And I told the people that were producing that show, I gave him a chance. I said, you need to have a talk with him. Tell him to knock this shit off. He's not saying stuff on the platform. He wasn't saying things like this on the show, but he was posting this kind of crap on Twitter. And I told him, if you don't if, tell him to knock it off or it, he's done, he's not going to be on the show anymore. I own the show. I don't, I don't record it. I don't edit it, but I own that show. And he continued to do it. And so he was gone. They let him go. Now, they came to that conclusion themselves, but they already knew that my stance was if he keeps this up, he's going to be gone. So I made that decision. Now, Spotify could also make that decision. I think that it is completely reckless for a publicly traded company like Spotify to have someone that they're paying $100 million to causing people to die because they're listening to him for bullshit like oh no you don't need the vaccine if you're healthy just do this and do that and people are dying that's true that's true but the thing is is this is a, a this is not just a spotify problem is it no i, I would agree diffi- with you 100 i never the, said it was diff- but this yeah, is the, this the is what we're talking about we're talking yeah, but, about spotify but the difficulty here is that um spotify is ultimately in the day is a business and all they're thinking about is correct if we if we if we go against this guy that we've invested a huge, this huge money uh, amount of money in, he might leave and take his listeners with him, and we want his listeners. Yeah, we want their subscriptions. Yeah, they're, so, so they're basically, so they're basically like a lot of companies a, are just ghoulish. Like Fox, Fox doesn't care well, about their listeners or their, or their viewers. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think I think a lot of people convince themselves, and the reason they sleep at night is that oh, you know, these accusations about that people are dying. It's not really that, and and also they go well if they weren't listening to Joe Rogan, they'd be listening to Fox News and doing the same things anyway. Right. So, so we know. might as well make the money. It's yeah, ghoulish. Well, I, I, like I said, it's 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 awful, and that just kind of shows you the society we live in today. It, but it's it but it's always been like that, David. It's nothing new and unique no. right now. It's always been this way. No, this is. I mean, going back 
yeah, we, 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 there's a famous story that the, uh, with the Ford Pinto. Yeah. That had, that had the gas tank that yep. um, could catch fire if it got rear-ended. Uh, and Ford basically did a cost-benefit analysis and decided it was cheaper to pay, pay off lawsuits to the families of people who had been burned to death in these types of accidents than it was to redesign the car. Yeah, and um, and yeah, companies have always been like that. But that's uh, but I think that's what we need to say. They've always been like that, and so you can't blame Spotify for not changing its spots because that's what companies do. You know, and good good on Neil Young for taking a stand, and good on Joni Mitchell for taking a stand because you've got to stand up and call people out if if that's the way you see it. Yeah. I think and, and I also do call me cynical, but I do think that Neil Young did this because it, it's been ten minutes and someone was talking about him. Remember, this is the same guy that refused to let his music get in any streaming service or, or downloadable service like Apple Music because the quality wasn't good enough for it. Like his well, music he, was yeah. such fucking and amazing shit, mention, anyways. And he did mention that as as his passing shot and say, "Well, I won't miss Spotify's lousy quality for my music." But you know what? Again, that is his right. It's free speech. Yeah. If he feels like that, that's absolutely Agree. fine. Anybody decides they don't want to be on a particular platform because they don't want to share it with somebody else they find distasteful. Yeah. That's perfectly fine. I think the difficulty is, look, everyone, companies like Spotify are coming from this um, this environment we we live in where any company associated with the internet also want always has always wanted to not become the censor of their platform they all want to take a hands-off approach because the problem is once you start censoring then it's the thin end of a wedge and it's never ending um you know and particularly given today's uh twitter driven uh you know media mobs going after people for the slices whatever is seen to be the slices infraction of whatever people decide are the rules this 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 week um you know i can in some respect in some respects i can kind of understand that attitude they're going well we don't want to get into this so we're just a a content platform and what happens from the people on our content platform is it is different is is not is not our concern i think the difference with spotify is is that when you go and start engaging big podcasters you are literally becoming a broadcaster at that point not just an internet platform yeah and i i think it's interesting that you know they're trying to continue to to play that well we're, ju- we're just a platform we we're, we're not a broadcaster approach when in fact they're paying the broadcaster for the words he says um, and that is going to have to come with res- some responsibility at some point. Unfortunately, they're, you know, this is what Twitter did. Twitter ignored um, what the uh, former president of the United States was saying for years. You know, um, giving him passes, having different rules associated with his account because he was the president, it was important. Uh, and ultimately, they acted too late when he went too far. Um, and uh, you know, I think Spotify needs to think about this and think about how they approach it in the future and have a a, a better view on what they do with it. I agree. Um, and and in the meantime, you know, artists will will leave. You're absolutely right that <laughs> Spotify is not going to lose any sleep about losing Neil Young or Joni Mitchell. Um, they might be more concerned if somebody like Taylor Swift. Oh, I guarantee you they would. And yeah. and it's not because that they're going to lose the revenue for her streams. It's going to be because of the bad press that's going to the be... The bad press, yeah. And the people who are going to be paying attention, which, let's be honest, is young people who are the core of their demographic. Or are they? Yeah. Maybe it's people that listen to Joe Rogan. Who who knows? And I believe we're on Spotify. Are we? I don't know. Oh, I, I, I've not seen a check recently, so... Uh... <laughs> They reached out to me years ago. Yeah, we're on Spotify. Um, yep, we are. So we're on Spotify. So anybody listen to us on Spotify? Hi. Yeah. Um, I I don't. I don't disagree with either party, exclusively. What I mean by that is, I get where. If you're a company like Spotify, where you don't have any control over this content. When, when do you step in? You know, that's well, that's well, not easy to yeah. do. But the difference with Joe Rogan is that Joe Rogan is exclusively on Spotify. 
true. It's not like it's not like us where they've just picked up our feed and republished it. Right. Yeah. They they have a contract with him uh, over a certain number of years, and he's exclusively on Spotify, which means that he is their paid broadcaster. Yep. He is not an independent entity who's just who they just use as a as a way of, of juicing their revenue numbers. Right. So so there is a while the one that might not be an editorial right and he's cut a deal where where he's turned around and said you don't get to tell me what i broadcast yeah they do have a responsibility about what the person they pay for is saying on their platform um and they should be able to have a conversation with him about it even if they don't tell him i'm, I'm sure they have had conversations about that even if they don't tell him you can't say that you know and ultimately i mean the, the problem is where does it end if he if joe rogan were to start promoting the next insurrection would they allow that to continue or would they step in at that point? good good question you know i mean it's interesting you would think what, that they what, would but uh, would they i don't know I, I don't well we don't know we don't know what spotify's corporate attitude to this is and as i say their corporate attitude is ultimately driven by firstly by their their customers and what their customers are prepared to pay for but secondly actually it's driven by their shareholders yep and if their share price goes down because their revenue numbers change because of something that Joe Rogan says or does, then I would imagine their shareholders would want to hold the board to account for that. I would think no? so, but I don't know. Where do you draw the line? Well, it, you, I think for shareholders, they draw the line at the share price. If it's affecting the share price, if it's going so much against the court of public opinion that it's affecting the value of the company, then, um, then people do do want to take steps i mean bring it round to the story we led with at the beginning here about activision or not quite led with but let's face it one of the reasons that activision was purchased by microsoft now was because they've had this toxic bro culture come out in the last 12 months include right all the way up to the ceo yeah and it's driven their share price down by about 40 50 percent and that uh, that made them an attractive purchase target for Microsoft. They, Microsoft might never have bought them when they were trading at, um, you know, $120 a share rather than 60 Well, but they actually think, yeah. I think they gave them 75 They actually Yeah, but even, even so, they still paid... They oh, still, I get it. Yeah. Well, they might have paid more than it's worth today, but they still paid less than what it used to be worth before this came out. Yep. You know? So it, it, these things do have an effect in the long term, but it ultimately, like many things in life, it does come down to the money rather than the ethics a lot of the time. Unfortunately, you are right, and and, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for this episode of Tech Fan. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. We'd love to get feedback from you. It's the show at techfanpodcast.com. You can always find us on Twitter and Facebook or at mymac.com or techfanpodcast.com and leave a note in the show notes, and uh, we'll read it here on the show. We missed one from Guy Searle on Geeks Pub, so we'll get to that next week. Um, So we hope you guys have been listening to... The Geeks Pub. I actually uh, put it in the Tech Fan feed, I believe, last week or the week before. So uh, people are getting caught up on the the Geeks Pub here on this channel. David, as always, good talk to you. Speak to you soon.